And if it's okay, I'm going to use the handheld. I don't do that well at podiums. I kind of like to wander around a little bit. Um, and uh, couldn't agree with you more about the 50 kilo content in the 10 kilo bag. That's actually our business, bags of 50 kilos and you know how to optimize that and so on. I'll get into that in a second. But um, I want to say first a bit of a disclaimer. Um, oh, actually, I also need the clicker. Is that there? Okay, perfect. I need to say a bit of a disclaimer because I think there are people in this room who know more about agriculture than I do, and there are people who know more about AI than I do, and I think there's more people who know, or people who know more about AI and agriculture than I do. So, I, but I, I guess I'm going to give a sort of a, a kind of a generalist point of view on what the World Food Program is doing um, and how we see the development of AI and some of these issues around food security, hunger and smallholder agriculture. And so, and I'm going to focus on smallholders more than I am any kind of uh, developed world agriculture, large scale uh, farmer, farming, agro-industrial farming, that sort of thing. Um, so, the starting point for us is the problem we're trying to solve. Good place to start in innovation, I think. The problem we're trying to solve is that one in nine people on this planet are still not getting sufficient quality and quantity of food. And in 2018, that's a disgrace. Let's be honest with ourselves. Because we have the means, and the question is just, how are we going to fix this problem? And I think you will be roughly familiar with some of the main causes of hunger. Natural disaster uh, is, is one of them, and frequent uh, or, or extreme climate events are happening more frequently um, and affecting more people. We also know that there's an uptick, actually, in the number of people affected by conflict, which drives acute hunger as well. People are displaced from their homes um, and living in precarious situations. They lose their livelihoods. And the, the, actually, the largest number of people living in hunger are those who live in chronic hunger. And chronic hunger happens when you do not, when over a long period of time, especially when you're a child, you are not getting access to the right quality and quantity of nutrition. This is a picture of nine-year-olds from a village in Western Guatemala who are stacked up against the WHO benchmark for normal age for height. And you can see how short they are, and that is not a genetic problem. That is because they have not received enough uh, and a quantity and quality of nutrition as they have grown in the first thousand days of life. And the worst part about hunger is that they can never recover from that. So if you, as a human individual, do not receive the right nutrition from the point that you're in the womb to the first two years of life, we know that, that, that there is irreversible damage that happens as a result. It doesn't matter how much they eat in their future. So this is why it's an important problem to address. And there's some good news, which is that the world is, on aggregate, making progress against hunger. So 25 years ago, we had a billion people living in hunger in the world. Um, in 2015, that number was dropped to 795 million, despite population increase over the same time. The slightly alarming news is that over the last two years, we've actually picked up 20 million more people estimated to be living in hunger. Some of that is probably due to some of the issues that I just mentioned, some of the increase in conflict and things that we're seeing. But this is not the kind of trend that we're looking for, obviously. And the question is, how are we going to address it? Now, just a little sort of um, explanation of the organization that I come from, the, the, the United Nations World Food Program. We are the uh, food, a a food Assistance Agency of the UN system. We work across 82 countries. We reach between 80 and 100 million people a year with some form of food assistance. We have a very large physical supply chain that, involve, that moves about 3.5 million tons of food assistance that has about 5,000 trucks at any one time. We run a small airline uh, to deliver food and deliver humanitarian workers. And on any given time, we've got 20 ships on the high seas carrying food. And increasingly, we're also using cash assistance. So last year, we delivered one and a half, or not quite one and a half, uh, about $1.3 billion worth of cash assistance to people uh, for the purpose of purchasing food. And that is because there are functioning markets in those places. So instead of delivering food and distorting local markets, we actually want to encourage that. And that's an important point to make when we talk about food markets and 
producers like smallholder farmers. Now, I do want to say this is the World Food Program, but there are other agencies of the United Nations that have uh, every bit as much importance to the fight against hunger as we do. We have a colleague here from the International Fund for Agricultural Development that works exclusively with smallholders on lending programs and other programs to reach and support smallholders. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN has a mandate for um, helping governments with food security policies, um, emergency food production related assistance, and lots of other things. So there's a, there's a community, of course, and then I'm not even mentioning civil society organizations and so on, but it's a large community of people fighting hunger out there. Okay, so let's get to the, a little bit more of the topic that we're here to discuss. So um, smallholder farmers, there's about 500 million of them worldwide. Um, it's, uh, smallholder farmers are estimated to contribute up to about 80% of the food supply for Africa and Asia. And yet the irony is that about um, half of the households affected by extreme hunger are actually also farmers. And that is because there are lots of challenges out there that face the food systems and smallholder farmers around the world. The challenges include, you know, how to, how to keep uh, increased yields, um, which needs the right inputs, the right uh, kind of uh, timing, the right knowledge, etc. There's a food loss and food waste problem. So, I mean, how many people, what, what's, I'm sure you guys know, um, how much food is wasted in the developed world? One third. How much food is wasted in the developing world? Well, you, it depends how you estimate it, but yeah, it's, it's actually about the same loss and waste in the developed countries as in the developing world. In the developed countries, we have a problem of wasting on the plate because we overproduce, overconsume, etc. So we all, we're, we're all familiar with that program or that problem. In the developing world, it's slightly different. Largely driven by post-harvest losses, insufficient storage, poor infrastructure, poor physical infrastructure, can't get the food to market. It actually spoils either on the way to market or even in the field if it's in, a, in, in a, the worst cases. And so that's the, the point here on access to markets is a big problem. So uh, if you're living in a place where even if you produced food, um, you want to market it, you actually don't know which market to take it to to get the right price. You don't know where your buyer is going to be. And you might be in a place where you have hours and hours of transport to actually get your food to the market. So you have to pay somebody, take your food somewhere, and you don't know what price you're going to get and if you're going to be able to sell it. And because you can't afford a silo or some other storage solution, you're selling it immediately after harvest so it doesn't spoil, which means the prices are low. And so there's an ironic problem in a lot of these food systems. And the irony is that you have a bad year problem, meaning you don't have enough rainfall or something happens and you have a crop failure. That's bad. But actually, if you have enough rainfall or a bumper crop, that is actually the good year problem because you still can't get that stuff to market. You can't profit from it. Climate change is a complicating factor. Um, we're seeing more and more hunger in general, but also problems in agriculture driven by climate change, extreme weather events, desertification, etc. And we're seeing conflict be a problem. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but people that are displaced as a result of conflict, and that displaces agricultural activity as well. Um, OK, so getting a little more to what is the take on, on AI and satellite work. Well, this, the satellite imagery has been used for quite a few years now already in looking at some of these issues. And so um, seasonal monitoring of rainfall is a really important factor. It's probably the most important determiner for uh, agricultural productivity in a year. And we've been working in this for several years, including setting up uh, parametric risk insurance programs. Andrew's going to talk about risk in a minute. But basically saying that the, the level of rainfall that you are receiving is a proxy for how good your yields are going to be. And on the basis of that, we've actually created some insurance programs. Some of them are experiments in microinsurance, but others are at a macro level. There's an organization now of the African Union called Africa Risk Capacity, which is a risk pool of African countries that pay in to the pool. And then when there's a poor year, 
they get a payout for humanitarian response as a result. Um, now, the question is, how effective is our current monitoring of that? Um, and how could it be improved by AI? <coughs> Pardon me. I, I think that there's lots of opportunities for that. You can do a lot more monitoring. And a, a, a big theme here is going to be around um, augmentation of human capacity for the analysis of this. You can do more automatic monitoring of images, but you can also then develop more predictive models um, based on what you're seeing. Um, I mentioned the issue of uh, conflict, same issue around sat satellite imagery. We're looking, we're using satellite imagery to look at what's happening as a result of conflict. So this is an example from South Sudan. You can see in one year of conflict in South Sudan between 2016 and 2017, you can see the amount of veget um, uh, uh, cultivated land being reduced. So in the image on the left, you, those intense colors are more intensive agriculture. So you can see on the right-hand side, after people were displaced, vir virtually no agricultural activity anymore. And again, using this is how we use satellite images. Uh, we're starting to look now at how we can uh, automatically monitor this by scanning, using AI to, to scan and give us alerts and that sort of thing. Um, and this is building up into all sorts of layering type uh, systems. So um, you take f uh, 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 the, the kinds of data that you can get from drones or satellites and you match that with ground collected data of some sort. I'm sure we're going to start talking about Internet of Things and all that and we're not quite there yet but, um, but matching it with the data that we have at ground level um, using open data, satellite uh, uh, data and imagery um, to, to kind of build up some layers and really be able to work toward predictive modeling of crop yields. And we're experimenting with this across two different countries now to have predictive yield um, estimates for individual seasons. And that helps us determine what we're going to need to give in terms of food assistance uh, or not. Um, another interesting area is around infrastructure assessment. So uh, the World Food Program does a lot of infrastructure work as well, um, building feeder roads, uh, building up water reservoirs, doing other sorts of infrastructure um, type projects, sometimes using people who are receiving food and we give them food as, pay uh, as payment for that. Um, so we want to be able to um, assess what's going on in the changes of infrastructure, but also when it comes to our humanitarian response, there's some sort of conflict or, or some sort of shock. Uh, it could be natural disaster, it could be conflict. Um, and we've used, again, for a number of years, we've used drone imagery and satellite imagery to look at the damages. But it also takes a lot of human analyst time. And we have been exploring across 13, whoops, bump the thing, 13 different countries. We're looking at automated monitoring of this. Um, and we, I think the, the idea is that, especially in a post-shock situation, it's critical in the first 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, that you have a view as quickly as possible as to what the damage is to your infrastructure. Not only so that you know what the impact is on people, but then you can also assess how you're going to reach people. Um, and this is probably, I think this is my, I think it's my last slide, but it's in some ways the most important, because this is the one that's pointing more to the future. Because everything that I've mentioned now um, is important data type gathering activities that we can aggregate and use for our work as the World Food Program. But how do we put information, data, and empower in the hands of small farmers themselves? And this is where you see a confluence of factors. So the penetration of mobile phone technology presents us with an enormous opportunity to deliver services in a different way to people, people of all types. Um, and, it and it also gives us an opportunity to, to communicate with people in completely different ways. So for example, we're now looking at how to foster communication between us as a service provider and people as service recipients. And this, if you think about it, this isn't a lot different than a customer service model for a company in, in, in another industry. We need to know what people think of our service in order to improve what we do. And if you think about it, well, if I think about it, five years ago, the only way that we had 
of collecting information on people's needs is a clipboard and a cluster survey, survey teams in the field asking people, how many meals did you eat today? Did you get the assistance you were promised from WFP, etc.? Clipboard and pencil or pen, and then stacks of paper. A few years ago, well, about four or five years ago, we started using, on top of that, we started using mobile phones to call people. And that came in really handy in, a, in the Ebola crisis when people were in quarantined areas and we wanted to get information out of them somehow to understand what the food security situation was. And we started calling people. And this was like, you know, a kind of, wow, we've got a whole new mechanism here. So that went, you know, if you, if you really work hard at it, you can do a couple hundred surveys or a couple hundred individuals um, interviewed in a month with a clipboard. And we've gone to 10,000 surveys a month using this mobile phone technology. And we have that in about, across about uh, 30 or 40 countries in, in place right now. But the next step for us is looking at a kind of chatbot technology. And I, I don't mean, I want to be careful with that, but it's a sort of a, it's, it's that AI-based interactive kind of technology to really not just hear 10,000 voices, but hear millions of voices. So how can we take, how can we aggregate that with automated means? How can we aggregate that information collection and communication process? That's one thing. But the other thing is all the things I've mentioned about um, predictive crop modeling and you know that sort of data, seasonal mapping and so on, all of that can be combined into new services that are available, made available to smallholder farmers. So we've experimented on mobile platforms already with delivery of weather information, uh, delivery of extension advice. But the next step of that is tailored or customized advice for small farmers based on what all of those systems are delivering in terms of information. So if you know that you're in a place in sub-Saharan Africa that's having a lower than usual rainfall, um, and it, it, your, somebody has understood what your crop history over the last five years has been, how drought resistant your particular land is, etc. You could combine all of that into a kind of automated agronomist and almost like your personal advisor on when should you plant in a year when you're expecting lower than usual rainfall, what crops should you plant in a year like that. Um, and you know, all of those sorts of kind of decision making uh, uh, parameters. And then when it comes to marketing, looking at, uh, we're, we're starting now to, again, with mobile platforms, we're linking the smallholder sellers with the purchasers. And we're doing that virtually. Um, we've got a couple of uh, different experiments. One is a, a, what we call a farm to market alliance. And that's uh, got 150,000 farmers in Eastern Africa involved. And we have a digital platform that we're experimenting with that has 50,000 of those on it. In the last year, we've transacted about $2 million of, of purchases of farmers selling their goods to buyers and also purchasing from companies the fertilizers and other kinds of inputs that they need for their growing season. And again, if, if we can find ways to optimize this kind of delivery of services, building on top of it financial services, insurance services, and other kinds of things, this really becomes the future of this space. So, Andrew, I hope I haven't taken too long, but that's what I wanted to give as kind of opening. Thank you very much, Robert. Really appreciate it. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, that was great, and a, I think a wonderful setup. I'm going to um, vamp for a second until the slides come up. Um, so I'm going to be giving you a very short, I think highly complimentary presentation to Robert. Uh, just to, for those of you who don't come from an agricultural uh, risk adjustment background, I'm going to talk a little bit about microinsurance in particular for smallholders. And I know that there are some people in this room that work on this. And just offer a couple of thoughts about where, uh, as we're tracking this particular innovation really closely as it relates to uh, to satellites uh, and, and AI together, uh, where it might be going in, at a product level in the next couple of years. So I thought I'd just start with it. And I, and I also, I want your collective, I would like to ask, maybe beg for your collective um, 
uh, appreciation of the fact that about 45 minutes ago, I didn't know I was going to give this talk. So <laughs> when, when Ruth unfortunately had to, had to bow it. So I thought I'd just show you just at a very beginner level, th this, is, uh, this is actually, a, I went, was sitting on the other side of that wall uh, and decided to go look at some corn crops and some cornfields in Iowa. So I just went into our, this is the, the visual GUI, the, the, the user interface to Planet's uh, satellite imagery. So this is just from a few days ago, May 10th. I just went to this place in, in Iowa. Um, and I, I just want you to notice something about it. And that is how regular it is. If you just think about this from a signals processing, signals gathering perspective, you know, it's a grid. It's a literal grid. You just look right down out, uh, on it and it's, uh, a, in, if you look at it sideways, and this happens to be obviously very early, this is uncolor corrected imagery, so this just uh, was an image that was taken a couple days ago. You know, this is what you see. What you see is large, monocropped, single varietals of corn, of wheat, of soybeans, etc. And that's inc uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, especially because today, contemporary, uh, highly industrialized and highly verticalized forms of agriculture, the kind we practice in, in places like Iowa, you know, farms, large, large and even medium-sized agribusinesses have basically become IT departments that happen to grow things. You know, they're incredibly data intensive. They've got um, some of the, the farmer, uh, far, mid and upper level scale farms that we interact with, you know, they have chief information officers. They have chief technology officers. Uh, and they're uh, running very sophisticated uh, systems that where they use satellite imagery today to optimize their inputs, to optimize water, to opt optimize uh, timing uh, of, uh, of all of their activities. And I compare that quickly to this picture. Uh, this is in Kenya, and you're actually looking here at two forms of agriculture sort of side by side. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you have uh, plantation, uh, this is, this I think happen to be, um, uh, I want to say they're not, they're, they may be cocoa plantations, but they're, they're, um, they're, uh, co I'm sorry, coffee plantations. They're, they're uh, highly organized, highly structured, not grid-like, but s still uh, highly characterized. And on the left-hand side, uh, over there, you have an, a, a riot of smallholder farms. And in those farms, for those of you who don't have an agricultural background, there's lots and lots of intercropping. So the field boundaries are really, first of all, these are really small. They're, um, they're highly irregular. People are planting yeah, uh, lots of different things all on top of each other. They're doing it at different times and not necessarily perfectly coordinated with their neighbors in the ways in which the, this, you know, the, the, the situation on the left makes the, the signals detection process to try to understand what's going on there very, very complicated and essentially really noisy. And you can sort of see it. It's sort of visually noisy, right? So we need, in that circumstance, all kinds of intense and high quality information about what we're looking at and what we're sensing. Now, the good news is, uh, you know, we could have actually organized this in such a way that Marshall could have come up and talked about, uh, you heard Marshall a little bit earlier talking about poverty, but Marshall's other line of work is around agricultural yield prediction in exactly these kinds of environments. And we're actually working together uh, in circumstances in East Africa where we're working with really good organizations to collect information on the ground uh, to um, uh, augment uh, satellite imagery and then to build models that can do not just uh, yield detection, but yield forecasting, at least over some initial set of crops. And that's incredibly interesting and it gets to a, a very powerful idea that as these tools get more and more sophisticated and, uh, and as we uh, generate more and more signals and we have more and more computational capacity, our ability to shift from retrospective analytics, what happened, to real-time analytics, what's going on now, to predictive analytics, what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, is coming along, along for the ride. And that is very interesting in particular in terms of building new kinds of productized instruments, the stuff that's at the top of the stack, on top of that. So um, 
What's interesting about this, in this case, I'm sorry, this is a little dark, but this is exactly the same image. From an insurance perspective, it's interesting to just to think about sort of mechanically how an insurer looks at that system, right? So they look over here and they see these large farms that are paying a big premium on their agricultural insurance. And they have a site visit cost. If something goes wrong, if you're historically looking at insurance, you say, I have to come out and do the claims adjustment process by which I figure out what your losses were. And those loss, that, the cost of that visit might be 50 bucks. And I, these are sort of made up numbers just to give you a sense of the effect. So that's a very insurable system. You've got a $1,000 premium. I've got $50 worth of prospective cost to come out and make sure that you're not lying to me when you said you lost your crop. Name, over here on the other side, however, you've got these small farmers. They're paying a tiny premium, and the claims adjustment cost doesn't change if you're them. And as a consequence, they're effectively uninsurable, right? The, the, the cost of going out and figuring out what happened, which might take months, might take many months, even a year, to get someone out, particularly in hard to reach and remote areas, is one of the reasons why it's just been economically infeasible to service people in, in this particular uh, community. <clears throat> and as a consequence, you take people who are already uh, near subsistence farmers, you expose them to the kind of increased risk that Robert mentioned in particular around climate exacerbated uh, meteorological shifts and, and, and uh, flood and drought risks. And suddenly you are in a situation in which people can't get insurance, they're at or near subsistence, and they can easily be, easily be knocked off their farms. And uh, a couple of years ago in East Africa, there was a fairly significant drought event. And uh, we were, um, there was, it was a, in, in, I should say in, in Western Kenya, there was an event that was uh, climate exacerbated. And I was talking to some of the public health folks who work in Nairobi, and they described that the following year, there was a really significant syphilis outbreak in Nairobi. And the question is, were those two things correlated? And they determined that they were by doing contact tracing, going back and looking at how it had started. And it had started because after the drought, uh, essentially a lot of young women, farmers, were knocked off their farms. They came into the city. Some of them entered the um, sex trade and became sex workers. That in turn changed the supply and demand of that kind of work in the city, which, allowed, which gave the purchasers of those services greater uh, leverage over the providers of those services to decondomize and led to an increased spread of a public health outbreak. So we're seeing you know, these kind of very long loops of causality and connection between these kinds of systems. Okay, so um, one of maybe the, the first really I think sort of marquee example of where this started to go in a very different direction was with the organization that Rose herself actually started uh, called Kalima Salama with a whole group of actors, including the Syngenta Foundation, one of the largest insurers in Kenya, the, um, the national uh, Safaricom, the, the national telecom, uh, to begin to build highly automated and highly scalable systems for delivering insurance to this previously difficult to reach population. And it really rests on three um, innovations that, con that concur here. They, they, they sort of co are coincident here. And I, I do want to say that picture of Planet Lab satellite is not the satellite that was used. It was the one I had on my laptop 15 minutes ago. So I apologize. <laughs> but, but you get the basic idea. That's not a planet satellite. That's a stand-in for all satellites. But basically, the, for those of you who don't know how this system works, it's actually really amazing. Um, what they did was they built a bunch of distributed weather sensors everywhere they had a wireless base station to provide mobile connectivity. So interspersed across the environment, they ha the landscape, they had in, in these growing regions, they had these wireless uh, weather detectors and rainfall detectors. They backed that up with satellite imagery, but the really important thing, and I think Robert alluded to this, was the, was the fact that now everybody was reachable uh, via their mobile phones. So the way this works is when a farmer purchases her inputs for the season, her seeds, she can purchase uh, for uh, a small incremental fee uh, an insurance product that insures those seeds against loss, those inputs against loss. And then once a particular metric or, or parameter is exceeded, whether it's total aggregate rain, uh, rainfall, if it's too high or too low, there is an instantaneous 
payout without a claims adjustment process. So that whole process disappears. That whole question of which camp you're in, are you in the wealthy camp or the poor camp, uh, goes away. And unsurprisingly, this began to really catalyze the market. And the thing I want to say is that what's really interesting, and I think worth remembering, especially with the technologists among us in this room, is how these, this is key enabling infrastructure. It's, you know, we, we, instead of thinking about how we're going to use these tools, it's often like the product that can now exist that couldn't have existed before in this particular uh, example, but in many others. And I, I, I'm increasingly curious about what that's going to be for, for AI in particular. So a few areas where this led, has led to real innovation. The first one is in just basic input insurance, the way I was describing to you. The second one is in credit extension, because the income for uh, farmers of all types is really historically very lumpy. So if you can provide financing instruments that allow people to smooth out their financial services life on top of that lumpiness by getting a very good sense not only of what's happening but what is likely to happen. Uh, that represents a really significant shift. And then the third one, and I, I sort of want to give you five euros for a, a great setup, uh, is in providing training and agronomic information, which is, hey, you know, we see you're in a place where there have been invasive pests that seem to be moving in terms of reporting into your area. So here's what we want you to do. Here's what we recommend you do. Or uh, we want you to delay growing or accelerate your growing season by a week or two. That, that kind of stuff as you go. And also basic things about adjusting fertilizer using best practices, represent the, the sort of knowledge opportunity built on top of that relationship. Leveraging AI to provide very targeted advice, I think, represents a really significant set of opportunities. There, there are just a couple of other uh, ones that I wanted to mention to you, and I, I just wanted to, I wanted to note them. I didn't put them up here, so let me just, whoops. Okay, and that's when I broke the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hold on just a second. Um, so the, the two uh, things that I wanted to also reference to you, that you the, the sort of unobvious things that you might be able to do with the infrastructure that's required for delivering a microinsurance product here. The first one is you can lower the cost of RCTs. You know, we're looking for what works in agriculture, generally speaking. And a big part of running a randomized control trial is going out and doing the very same thing you'd have to do to do a claims adjustment. What happened, right? In the process, if we can begin to monitor the outcome of RCTs using these technologies remotely, we can presumably do them for less money and we can do more of them which means we can get more nuance among a set of variations, or we can actually test a wider variety of potential interventions. So that's really interesting. The second thing that I think is, is fascinating here that I wanted to, to reference for you uh, beyond the predictive analytics piece um, is how we might leverage predictive analytics for not directly for growing things, but actually for support for other parts of agricultural activity. And the one uh, in particular that I'm thinking of is work we're doing with a partner who has essentially an equipment rental. So they basically rent out the harvesters and the planters at various points of the season across India for, for what are uh, small and sort of lower medium scale farms. The ability to get real-time satellite information allows that person who's doing essentially the Uber for tractors model to get more value out of the tractor by making sure that the tractor is where it needs to be to do its work the day it gets there. Like it only goes to places that are ready for harvest. But as a consequence, because this is a social enterprise, it translates into lower rental costs for the farmer. So there's a whole opportunity to begin to move assets around in a way that, that didn't exist before by producing greater situational awareness for farmers. And all of that, uh, yields, all, I mean, and I think there are other ones that are actually in the supply chain, for instance, being able to understand where the bo potential bottlenecks are around spoilage. And I think it was you, I'm, uh, who maybe this morning, someone over here asked this question about supply chain logistics monitoring. And it represents a huge opportunity in agriculture, and we're spending a lot of time thinking about it. So that's another place that's sort of ancillary to microinsurance where we might be able to bundle in additional risk adjustment. And all of that
that we hope results in uh, greater supply chain trans uh, consistency, that is to say being able to deliver the same cal cal calories reliably, de-risking of new behaviors. This is the other thing that people don't understand about insurance, is that insurance creates a floor for most for you. So if you're insured, you might be able to take a, a slightly different risk. If your downside risk is, is insured, your ability to take a risk on a, maybe a higher yield crop or a high, higher yield varietal of the same crop uh, presumably goes up. And also, I think it's important that, that insurance represents a mechanism by which, by providing differential pricing on insurance products, we can encourage people to diversify their behaviors in ways that, in the same way that we think about a portfolio, if you're growing five things and one or two of them might be particularly um, high yield but, but not crop resistant, but the balance are, that we can allow people to basically change the risks so that when there is a catastrophic event or if there is a significant uh, uh, meteorological or climate induced event, the losses aren't the same. So there's just a lot of opportunity in there to calibrate the signal and the behavior. And with that, uh, oh, I'll just say, oh, let me see if I show this. Oh, no, I'm going to skip this. That, that sort of makes that point. I just wanted to leave you with this idea that this idea is leaving agriculture. And it's showing up in other places that we want to think about beyond uh, the ag market. Th this one in particular is um, um, an organization called MicroRisk. They're doing exactly the same thing for people who live in communities where their personal individual disaster risk may be particularly high because of the kind of place they live, because of where in their community they live. I, earlier today, I mentioned this example of, um, of Dar es Salaam. In Dar es Salaam, they've literally changed the flow of the river delta that goes through the city, and they've changed who's at risk from a flood when a flood occurs. And they're certain that floods not only can but will occur. So the ability to to link this sort of same approach to many different domains that are affected by the SDGs for vulnerable people is, a, I think, a significant one. And with that, I'll say thanks very much.